Hey class, welcome back to our, our second set of notes in Unit 3, Earth Systems and Resources. Um, 3B is looking at Earth's water supply and management. Uh, the specific criteria here is going to focus on watersheds, but a little bit more about um, what the Earth's kind of water budget is, uh, how much water is on the Earth, and, um, and uh, things we do uh, to try to maintain that supply. Uh, so first we have a draw in here. Uh, the draw for this one is going to refer to, as I start clicking through this graph uh, primarily, uh, basically what we're going to talk about is the Earth's water budget. How much fresh water is available to us? Uh, to begin with, this is kind of a, a unique diagram here. We start looking at all the Earth's water, uh, including oceans, um, is kind of represented on this, this globe. Uh, and then you start looking at the amount of fresh water uh, that's available, or all of the Earth's fresh waters is tiny little dot down here, and then fresh water in our lakes and rivers is like not even visible. Um, so really just trying to look at in comparison how little fresh water is available, and that's really what we're trying to get at in this uh, these three charts here as well. I put a little um, symbol here representing that this is not something we have access to. Uh, so all the water, total water, 96 0.5% uh, is ocean salt water, so it's not fresh water, um, so we can't use that. Uh, so our remaining 2.5% of fresh water um, gets kind of blown up. And of this fresh water, you're looking at um, most of that, almost 70% is ice caps and glaciers. So again, really, this portion, really not super accessible. So of our 2.5%, 70% of that um, is not really uh, realistically usable. Um, by people in its current state. And then we look at uh, what's available now. So what is people can we use of this fresh water supply? Well, we can use the groundwater portion and then surface water like lakes, rivers, and streams. So we take that percent now that surface water, we have like 1.3% of that uh, left over and we can blow that up and uh, some of that surface is ice and snow, lakes, atmospheric water. So even all of this is not super accessible. So we do rely very heavily on lakes, rivers, streams, surface water, and groundwater for our water supply. So our next uh, section here is on global water use. We're talking about wh where does all this water go? So of this, this small percent of fresh water we have access to, what do we do with it? Uh, and that's the big question here. So uh, in this draw, you have another chart, um, but really there are kind of four major designations for where we put our water worldwide. Um, the first and most primary one in the number one spot is agriculture. So as we're drawing this, this is 67 percent, 67. A lot of times you see this number rounded to 70 percent for agricultural purposes. Uh, most of the water we use ends up in this category. So this gets placed number one. Uh, two, power generation. When we talk about power generation, uh, we're simply referring um, to the generation of electricity and the water that's needed as a part of the process to come through, create steam, um, uh, use cooling towers, all the things that we use water for. Um, so that falls in number two. Uh, the next one, three, is municipal. Um, so third place, municipal. This is our domestic. A lot of times you'll hear this term uh, as well. All right, so domestic water supply. Um, this is the stuff that you'd be using in your home. Um, you know, washing, uh, showering, dishes, all that stuff. And then the last bit, 7% uh, is industrial in fourth place. So domestic industrial are pretty uh, similar here. Um, but this is simply referring to manufacturing and mining uh, and the water that's, that's needed in those um, processes. So to begin with, we'll talk about what a watershed is here. Um, a watershed is basically in in an area of land that drains out in this predictable way. Um, it, it goes into a specific body of water, which is typically a river uh, or a lake, and then kind of follows this kind of downhill slope, essentially, until um, it rests in a larger body of water. Uh, so in this diagram here, <clears throat> excuse me, in this diagram here, we're talking about watersheds um, flowing, uh, obviously, from like rainfall up to a high peak. And then you see these arrows showing how water moves. So if we have a raindrop up here, and this raindrop is going to fall to the top of this peak, what ends up happening is it's going to follow the slope in a predictable way. Um, 
you know, if it falls on, raindrop falls over here on this side, then it's going to follow the slope down this way. Uh, ultimately, these could lead to different streams or rivers, and that's going to carry the water to different places. So our raindrop here, all these on this side, you can see this um, kind of divide. I'll, I'll kind of mark this in red for you. But this could be something like our Great Divide or Continental Divide through the Rockies, where uh, if it falls on one side, it tends to flow into the Colorado River. If it falls on the other side, it ends up eventually in the, the Mississippi River. But as we follow this, you can see like this water is going to end up in this river. It's going to flow through. This water is going to come this way, end up in this river. And then ultimately, it starts to flow through and get carried out to its final destination. Whereas this water over here is going to go somewhere else. It's not on our map. So this is what we mean by a watershed. Now, what are some things that are going to determine the watershed of an area? Well, it's all about this topography here. A slope, ridges, vegetation, soil composition. If I have more vegetation, like these plants here, what's going to end up happening is they're going to trap some of this, and the more vegetation you have, the more water is going to sit here, and it's actually going to infiltrate down into the soil, and boom, groundwater right there. So we're going to start to get this aquifer, which is our groundwater, recharged with more vegetation to keep the water here. Uh, more concrete, more parking lots, more streams, more uh, uh, ditched up rivers and streams are going to end up pushing water farther away from the groundwater. Uh, a greater slope is going to be faster runoff and reduce soil erosion and then higher soil permeability. So these three things are going to be big factors here. The more permeable soil, the more water is going to get into this um, area for recharge. Uh, human impacts on watersheds, what are some things we do? Well, clear cutting. So if we decide, hey, um, you know, we need to get rid of this forest over here, uh, obviously we're going to recharge less water uh, into the aquifer. Uh, urbanization, like we said, more concrete is going to run off more water farther away. Uh, something like a dam is going to, uh, like we have in this diagram, it's going to hold water back here but prevent water from moving downstream and affect watersheds in those areas. Um, and then mining, obviously more mining can lead to uh, more water use, more polluted water, and those are whole other things. We'll save pollution a little bit later um, into the year. Uh, we also can experience periods of water stress. So if this, like we just have something like droughts where we just get less rainfall coming from here, uh, obviously that's gonna affect in a natural way just the amount of recharge that occurs. Um, so as people, in a, a global planet here, we see water stress occur. We see it out in the West, primarily in the United States, um, away from a lot of water resources, freshwater resources. Really, the Colorado River is the resource, uh, whereas by us, we have the Great Lakes as the primary um, freshwater resource here. Uh, but you can see globally, there are definitely some, some significant periods of areas of water stress that occur. Um, where they don't have access to enough water. So what are some things that we do uh, to respond to water stress? What are some of these, these things these areas are doing? Uh, well, you can look at things like aquifer pumping, uh, removing groundwater uh, for use. Obviously, there's, there's groundwater there. We know how to access it. We can pump it up and use it. Um, Advantage is it basically is available to local crops particularly, um, and we don't need to transport it, so that saves on energy. However, those supplies are limited, and it's difficult to estimate how much is actually there. Uh, so you can see there are some disadvantages here, too. It requires drilling a well, pumping, uh, removal is always almost faster than recharge. So you can kind of see this is the Ogallala Aquifer, just a diagram of the water that's present. And this um, animation will just continue to click through, and you can kind of see that as we go throughout this, uh, we start to decrease the amount of available water that occurs. And so we're kind of losing some of the, uh, the aquifer uh, available. Um, and this is a primary aquifer used by kind of the breadbasket uh, states of America here, uh, talking about uh, a lot of the agricultural uh, production that occurs for us. Uh, another thing we do to respond to water stress is, well, as water's flowing by us, we create 
a, uh, a dam to capture and store runoff, and then we can we can use that um, we can use that water as needed. Uh, so here, right, we have a dam. Um, this is Las Vegas here. We'll talk about this a little more in class. Um, but you have the Hoover Dam set up here, and that is creating this big reservoir, um, Lake Mead, back here. And what's happening uh, in this diagram as it goes through, as you can see, as the city gets bigger, um, the reservoir gets smaller, so demand for water has increased here. Uh, what are some advantages of this process? Well, reduced flooding. Uh, we can control how much water comes through there. Uh, we can generate hydroelectricity, which is good. Uh, we can supply uh, irrigation water to farms, uh, which is good to produce food. And it, that zero emissions electricity, I mean, these linked together, but a uh, really important concept that this is not creating uh, carbon dioxide and contributing to or towards our pollution and climate change. Uh, disadvantages, it can displace people. Um, here, that wasn't the case, but in some areas, uh, native people are displaced by this flooding. Keep in mind, this was just a, a river. I mean, granted, a big river, uh, but it wasn't flooded out like this originally. Um, impaired ecological service of the river. Things need to move from here to here, right? And when they can't do that, because there's a big wall in the way, it, it's, it impedes its, its progress. So things like sediments need to flow, fish need to move, um, and it, this becomes an obstacle for them. Uh, water can evaporate. Still water can evaporate um, before use here. And uh, it can cause other lakes, rivers, and streams to dry up. So like at the end of the Colorado River, this is at the end. Instead of flowing out uh, into the ocean, um, it just dries up. So we definitely see that uh, occur as all disadvantages. Uh, something else we do to respond to uh, water stress is irrigation. So just moving water uh, to dry areas for crops. Uh, so that Colorado, once it's dammed up, is heavily irrigated. And uh, there are canals that will take and transport the water uh, elsewhere. Uh, this helps to grow in dry climates, and uh, crops do not need to be directly next to a water source, which is good. We can grow crops in more places. Uh, the bad news is the water evaporates during transport. We can increase the salinity in the water as it moves, um, and these can be big-time issues. Obviously, we can run out of, of water as well. Uh, so in the Aral Sea, you can see that here. Um, as time passes on, the body of water becomes less and less. Uh, this is fresh water in the desert. There are tons of crops that are being used uh, from that water source, and that's the reason this is drying up. Uh, another thing we can do to get more fresh water is this process of desalination. So removing salt from seawater by uh, distillation uh, primarily. Uh, pretty good advantage if fresh water source is nearby is not needed, uh, but nearly all the water on the planet is salt water, and, and that's if we could harness that in a reasonable way, that makes a lot of sense. However, this isn't widely done worldwide because it's very costly, requires energy, uh, can kill organisms in the water, and creates this briny wastewater. It's really salty product uh, that has to be disposed of. Uh, it is more common in places like Saudi Arabia uh, where their access is salt water um, and they have more desal plants. Uh, solutions, water conservation. Um, you know, certainly we can you know, turn the tap off, brushing our teeth, uh, but more importantly, we need bigger scale solutions to manage water supply. So increasing the price of domestic water is one thing to force people to use a little bit less um, water and uh, use it a little more responsibly. Currently, uh, water is very cheap, and uh, it is one of those things that uh, is probably regularly abused on a domestic level. Uh, regulate export of local water resources to keep watersheds intact. So, um, you know, don't allow pumping and exporting of water from certain places. Even th things like bottled water plants that will pump from a place in Michigan and they'll ship it all over the United States. Uh, that removes it from its local watershed. Um, pay farmers to use efficient irrigation. Uh, this is not always the case. Um, you know, having closed pipes instead of open canals allows the water to move without evaporating um, to such a high degree. And we also use something called drip irrigation technology, which is pictured here. Um, that provides uh, focused water directly to the root system of a plant uh, so it can be used more efficiently than spraying water all over the place and having a high percentage of that evaporate.